Hi, my name is Ryan Stewart, and I'm obsessed with horses. <laughs> While this may sound like the beginning of an AA speech, I can ensure you that it is not. It's my story, and I'm here to share it with you. First off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I first realized my love of horses when I was four years old, and that's a picture of me on the left riding my first horse. It was at my friend um, Taylor's uh, grandparents' house, and ever since then, I just fell in love with them. Um, just something about them just kind of makes me like drawn to them, and um, I just realized that I um, would like a career with them for the rest of my life. Um, the picture on the right is 12 years later, and that was taken last summer. Um, and that is at my current job uh, working with Snoop Dogg, which is the horse in the middle. Um, something about Snoop is he has had a great impact on my life. Um, he is the first horse that is potentially going to be mine, and I'm very excited about that. Um, my boss is giving him to me um, after working there for three years and um, I have the opportunity to take him to college if I can prove to my mom that um, I'm in it for real. So I'm so nervous about that because I just need to find a way how to prove that to her. So why I am in ISM. Um, the first reason is I would really like to learn as much as I can um, to make my dreams come true. Um, I would very much like to have my own horse ranch and be able to train um, any type of horse, any discipline. Um, that's my overall goal. And so um, by being in ISM, I feel like I'm putting my dreams into action. I feel like um, through all of these interviews and research that I'm learning as much as I can um, in the now. And um, I feel like I'm taking all the steps necessary in order to become a better educated horseman. Um, right now, I've been working with horses for about four years. And while I have learned so much in those four years, I know that that is not anything compared to what I need to learn in order to have a successful career. Um, I went on six interviews. And my first interview was with um, Bob Dorn and he is the owner and trainer at um, Circle D Ranch. He was probably um, the most insightful and probably gave me the most honest advice and I did learn a lot. One thing that he said um, that kind of, I, I guess, got under my skin was um, I asked him what was um, a difficult part of his job and he said that like women think that they like run the horse industry um, and so they come in and they tell him that like he doesn't know what he's doing and that like they try and take over everything and that just kind of like I guess I took it the wrong way because um, I would never tell someone how to train their horse like that's your horse and the like what you do with it is your decision and I have like no right and no um, like reason to come in and tell you that you're doing everything wrong that's like a, um, a parent coming to another parent saying that like you're parenting your child wrong like you have no right to do that. Um, and so, I don't know, I guess um, I want to be able to like prove him wrong and like, I think like everyone in the horse industry is um, in equal parts. My second interview was with Mary Hopper and um, she has a barrel racing ranch in Aubrey. Um, she was definitely one of my favorite interviews. Unfortunately, while I was there, I learned that she was not a trainer. She was um, the owner of the ranch, and she um, teaches lessons, um, which could be helpful, but not in the field that I'm necessarily looking to pursue. Um, one of my favorite things I've learned through all my interviews was her explanation of barrel horses. She kind of explained to me how um, they're kind of like the redneck sport of horse, um, of like, in the world of like equestrian and um, she said that a lot of people will get on a horse and say like oh well my horse can turn around trash can so like obviously I have a barrel horse but like people don't understand that barrel horses have so much more to them than turning around like a barrel like they have to carry themselves the correct way and be able to like swing their hind end around the barrel in order to make it a fastest time and not to injure themselves and so I just thought that um, I never thought about it that way, that people um, 
think that they can get on a horse and say, oh, well, I have a barrel horse. Like, um, people aren't going to get on a cutting horse, which um, cutting horses um, sort cows in, like, um, arenas. Um, they're not going to get on a cutting horse and say, oh, well, let me go, or they're not going to get on any horse and say, well, I'm going to go cut some cows because, like, if you're on Arabian, that's not what they're brought to do. You would want to be on a quarter horse. So I thought that was really interesting. My third interview was with Punk Carter, and he is um, a very high up trainer for big horsemen such as Chris Cox and Dan James. And they've both won the, um, I think, one of the worlds in a really big competition. Um, and one of my favorite things about him was that he uses natural horsemanship techniques, which um, are techniques that don't really use, um, the best way I can explain it is it's just kind of like more over like bonding and teaching them rather than like um, like sitting there for an hour doing something over and over and over them, over again tr with them trying to like enforce information into their head. It's just kind of like working with them um, like little steps at a time um, and letting them like think about it and really process it so that they can actually learn and not be scared to um, be worked with again. Um, and so where I work now, they use natural horsemanship techniques. And so I'm really for that and would really like to learn a lot more about that. So that was a really cool thing. Um, I asked him what was so different about training cutting horses than any other type of discipline. And he said that cutting horses have to be so well trained that they can do anything on the like at the drop of a hat. If you ever watch um, cutting horses in a competition, um, it looks like they're doing everything by themselves. Like it doesn't look like the rider is doing anything. So um, they're so well trained to um, like know what they need to do, and I think that's so cool. And so he said that. Um, since they're so well trained, a lot of people um, want reject cutting horses because they're already trained, they're smart, they know what they're doing, so like they don't have to do any training, they can just like get on them. And cutting horses are really expensive too, so if they like um, fail out of the like cutting horse world, um, they can get a really good horse um, a lot, lot cheaper. My fourth interview was with Tiffany Williams. And she gave me very good advice, even though she was very straightforward with everything she said. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask um, trainers is what breed do you prefer to work with? And out of everyone I interviewed, all of them said quarter horses except for her. She has a thoroughbred preference, which um, thoroughbreds are mainly used on racetracks. Um, and so I asked her why, and she said that she likes to give them um, life after the racetrack because um, racehorses, all they know how to do is run. They're like, I go into the gate and I run and I run until I know I need to stop. And so she likes to give them like um, an afterlife type thing and like rehabilitate them to like um, teach them that not everything is about going fast and that they can slow down. And so she teaches them like kind of how to like properly use themselves and um, she trains jumpers so um, that's what she does. <laughs> um, she was my first mentor candidate. I um, absolutely loved her and so after my interview with her I um, emailed her and called her and texted her and she didn't respond so I just kind of had to let that go. And so I went on my fifth interview with um, Martin Campbell and he was super interesting. Um, he came out on a riding lawnmower um, up to me and it was the strangest thing I think I've ever experienced. And then he just kind of like got up like it was no big deal and I was like, okay, so I just kind of rolled with it. And so um, he gave me a lot of great advice. Um, he was an older gentleman, so he had been um, in the industry for a really long time. So he had a lot of great things to say. And so whenever I asked him what the favorite um, what his favorite part of the job was, he, he said nothing, it's all work. And um, that just, like, I kind of had to like question that. I was like, and I could tell that he knew that that's not what I wanted to hear because then he added, and he was like, I like to see the progress between like the horse and the student. And I could tell that he knew that that's just what I wanted to hear. But um, when I asked him what the worst part of his job was, he said, um, 
that a lot of people don't um, appreciate like his advice and like what he does for um, the horse and the student and so sometimes he has to tell them like that they need to find another place to ride or um, what I found interesting was that sometimes people just like aren't good um, like they like whenever it comes to horses you either like like it's like sports you either like have it or you don't it's not something you can like really learn so um, well in, in my opinion but um, so he said that sometimes he has to tell people that um, that they're just like not cut out for it and that kind of broke my heart listening to that because I can't imagine anyone telling me that I couldn't do what um, I've dreamed of doing since I was four years old like that's just not something that I'd ever thought about so I could definitely see how that would be um, a really hard part my sixth interview was with um, Sandy Holt and she has a ranch in Aubrey and I kind of consider her like me in the future. Whenever I interviewed her, um, I asked her what type of training she did and she said um, she does all round training, which is what I want to do. So, and like anyone can bring a horse to her and um, like ask her to train it and she can do it because she's skilled in every type of discipline. Um, whenever I asked her what her favorite part of the job was she said working with the horses and I was so surprised that she was the only one that said this because that is my like that's my favorite part is working with them and like noticing them learning and the change in them and so um, I thought that was really awesome um, she was my second mentor candidate and I really thought that things were going to go um, good this time and I asked her and she said yes and then afterwards um, she never responded so um, I had to move on again. And so this leads me to my mentor. Um, my mentor is Chris Ruthven. And no, you're not mistaken, his name was not on any of those slides. Um, I've been working with Chris for about three years now um, at CNC Colt Company. That's where I volunteer. And um, he has been such an influential person in my life. He um, and his wife Karen are the people um, who made me realize that I wanted to train horses and not just be around them. Um, and so Chris is originally from New Zealand and he trained horses in New Zealand and Japan before coming to um, the United States to learn under people such as Pat Pirelli, which is a really big natural horsemanship person. Um, and he was um, a pro bull rider in New Zealand also. And so I'm super excited to work with him. Um, he's inspired me a lot so far and um, I can't wait to see what's to come. For my research, um, I wasn't quite sure what to do at first, but then as I just kind of like got the ball rolling, um, I kept thinking of more and more ideas. So I first started out with the Mustang Makeover Challenge, which is a competition um, that takes place every year. Um, they have um, trainers come in from around the world, and they have 140 days to train a wild, untamed Mustang. So the um, the Land Bureau and Management Program takes these Mustangs from the wild and brings them um, to these trainers so they've never been touched or anything and they have 140 days to train them. And after the 140 days is up, they bring them to this competition and um, show what they can do. And so the grand prize is $200,000, so that's good. But I think the best part of it is that um, all the Mustangs are auctioned off after the competition. and so. Um, it's not just like a competition for fun, it's with cause. Um, so 600 out of um, 2,500 horses um, every year are adopted through Mustang Makeover. And I think that's great because that means that um, all these horses being used in this competition aren't going back out into the wild. And so the picture is actually from 2013. Um, I went and um, this is the only one that I've seen. but. Um, this is the man who won and he trained this horse to um, walk into this car and sit down and let him drive him around. And I think it's the most adorable thing I have ever seen. It was so cool. My second research assessment was over um, horse slaughter. And what made me want to research this was um, I've learned a lot about um, food industries using horse meat, like even in America. And so um, I just wanted to know people's um, opinions on whether or not they were for or against it. And so I learned 
that um, over 92% of horses that are slaughtered are able to live um, healthy, productive lives. So that means that they're taking um, horses that aren't crippled or old or injured, um, that they're perfectly fine and they're taking them and slaughtering them for um, mainly for um, countries in Asia for food. Um, and so a lot of people think that slaughterhouses use um, humane techniques, like they'll put them down and then like um, manufacture them or like take their meat off, but um, that's actually not true. Um, slaughterhouses, um, a lot of the workers in slaughterhouses um, actually will like whip horses in the face and like they like hang them up while they're still alive and um, they make the pregnant horses like have their babies in the slaughterhouse. It's really sad. Um, and so I thought that this next fact was pretty interesting that when horse slaughter was banned in California in 1998, um, horse slaughter went down, or horse theft went down by 34% after the ban. And so I just, I don't understand why people would want them to be slaughtered in the first place whenever um, only good comes out of it. Um, my third research assessment was over Pat Pirelli, and he is a natural horseman, and he has his own um, technique and um, like games are called. They're um, just exercises to do with your horse, um, and it's all called Pirelli. And so he started out being a stable hand at the age of nine. So um, if there were horses at the barn, then he was there every single day. Um, he apprenticed under Freddie Ferreira, who originally taught um, him how to be natural with the animals. So um, basically, um, this man influenced one of the best horsemen in the entire world, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, he was in the rodeo circuit and um, rode bareback Bronx for a couple years, and he ended up um, winning a championship. But after um, rodeo, he decided to train colts for a living, and um, at first, the business was going well, but um, the salary in the horse, wor horse world is not that great. That's why I think you have to love it to be able to do it. And so um, he got so like frustrated that he was just going to quit and give it all up. But he realized that he kind of had a true talent at um, telling other people, um, like explaining to them how they need to be with their horses or like um, giving them advice on like how to train them. And so instead of training horses, he decided to like train people. And so um, through all of his um, experience, he is now one of the best horsemen in the world today. My last research assessment is over liberty training. And this is by far my favorite assessment that I've done. Um, I just heard about liberty um, maybe two weeks ago, I think. I was on Instagram and I found like all these accounts that use Liberty and they post all these pictures of them. And Liberty is basically, there are eight exercise, or eight connection exercises that you do with your horse and it's not riding, it's um, groundwork. And so um, you're building a really strong bond with your horse through these exercises and you're getting all that trust. And um, through these exercises I've learned that your horse will soon like want to come to you, not um, only having attention sought from your part, um, both sides would equally be um, sought from each other. And so um, I just found that to be really, really interesting that there's ways that you can like just bond with your horse to make them like want to be with you. That way, whenever you're training them, um, they're not running away from you in the pasture whenever you're trying to find them. And so that concludes all of my ISM research. Thank you, I think.